First speaker uh, is a local speaker, so one of my colleagues, Dr. Matt Cage from Tripler Army Medical Center. Um, he did his residency here at Tripler Army Medical Center and his uh, fellowship at uh, UC Davis, California. He's an adult and pediatric uh, spine surgeon at Tripler Army Medical Center. So he'll speak to us to this today on a topic of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. All right, thank you, Kyle, for the discussion and the invite to come back and speak again. Um, I'm Matt Cage, and, and like Kyle said, I'm from the military hospital. It's the pink one on the hill that you probably saw when you, when you flew into Honolulu. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, implant density and, and relative to um, uh, uh, AIS fusion constructs. And so in this talk, none of the opinions are uh, official policy of the DOD. They're my own opinions. Um, so in astronomy, the term the Goldilocks zone is used to refer to the region surrounding a star where planetary temperatures are just right to allow for liquid water to exist and thus the possibility of life. And so for the next 20 minutes, I just want us to consider the possibility that for each moderately sized flexible AIS curve, there may also be an implant density that's just right. And as a primer, I just want you to think about the two radiographs on the screen and while you know, the results are not perfect, but um, roughly equivalent radiographic and clinical outcomes were achieved with widely different implant densities. And so we've heard this time and time again, the U.S. healthcare care spending is out of control. And what do we get for all this spending? Well, compared to 38 other high income countries, we're still dead last for chronic conditions, death from treatable conditions and a whole host of other negative health related categories. And in the past two decades, the cost of spine fusion surgery has received a lot of attention, both in the lay media and in the scientific literature. And so this study from 2010 uh, at NYU demonstrates that implants were the largest contributor to the overall cost of AIS surgery. And, like, and unlike other technological innovations, the cost of AIS surgery has not decreased over time. The mean hospital charge for AIS surgery rose 113% from 2001 to 2011, and these authors cited that the implant charges were the main culprit for the rapidly increasing cost. And over this time period, there was also a 70% increase in implant density. So not only were the implants becoming more expensive themselves, uh, we were just using a whole lot more of them. And today, um, uh, despite uh, enhanced recovery protocols, which unequivocally reduced the length of hospital stay, hospital charges for AIS surgery continue to rise. And so from the kids inpatient database, the average hospital charge for AIS fusion surgery exceeds $200,000. Um, in addition to cost concerns, there's also some safety concerns associated with spinal implants. Each pedicle screw carries an inherent risk for malposition. Um, an SRS POSNA task force showed that uh, the risk for screw malposition is approximately 9%. And as we all know, many malposition screws are not of any significant clinical consequence. However, the MIMO uh, Minimize Implants Maximize Outcomes study group showed about a one to 4% rate to return to the OR for a screw malposition. However, in 2023, the use of intraoperative CT is a great way to mitigate your risk for return to the OR for a malposition screw. Um, these authors cited that the cost of an intraoperative CT scan was about $232 while uh, a return trip to the OR um, was approximately $5,000. Additionally, lower implant densities have, um, may have some other advantages. They include uh, increased or decreased blood loss, decreased surgical time, and potentially less radiation if you're not solely relying on freehand technique and intraoperative CT verification. So clearly there are some potential advantages to using less screws, but the real question is, can we produce an equivalent or better clinical outcome with a lower implant density? And then if we can do this, um, we can significantly improve the value of scoliosis surgery. Before we can fully attempt to answer that question, it's important to look back and see how we, we got to where we are today. Um, and so prior to 1995, um, strategically placed hooks and wires as described by Cottrell and Dubassay were used to exert 
multiple force vectors to correct thoracic scoliosis. In those years, if pedicle screws were used, um, they were or used in the thoracic spine, they were typically placed in the hook pattern. But after 1995, um, after Dr. Suk published a seminal paper investigating the efficacy um, and safety of segmental uh, pedicle screw fixation, um, uh, things began to change. And so he compared the um, uh, hook constructs with pedicle screws placed in the hook pattern versus segmental pedicle screw fixation, meaning bilateral pedicle screws at every level, and they found three things. Better coronal plane deformity, correction, better maintenance of the correction at two years, and better correction of the compensatory curve in the segmental pedicle screw group. And not only that, they showed that pedicle screws in the thoracic spine were safe with only 3% of their screws being malpositioned with no neurologic complications. So subsequent studies continue to show a superiority of segmental pedicle screws over other techniques. Other cited advantage of pedicle screws included shorter fusion constructs, decreased need for anterior surgery, improved pulmonary function, better correction of the axial plane, and better correction of the compensatory curve. And then attempting to capitalize on better correction, surgeons gradually began to increase their use of pedicle screws. So in addition to greater correction, increased implant use was rationalized with the idea that more screws provided rigid fixation and less stress per screw. And because the screws had a lower pseudoarthrosis rate compared to hooks and wires, the conventional wisdom must have been more screws must be better. Unfortunately, during this time period, these claims had not been proven, nor had the uh, better clinical outcomes been shown. And there was even some data to suggest that using more screws was not improving our, corrector, our correction, as shown in this 2010 study by Quan et al., where you can see that year by year, the implant density um, is increasing, but the uh, correction of the um, cob angle is not improving. Um, during this evolving time, the reduction maneuvers for AIS also became increasingly more sophisticated, attempting to maximize three-dimensional correction. And because these, uh, the correction forces um, are higher with these techniques, more points of fixation were needed to complete the maneuvers. The concept of implant density uh, was first described by Clements in 2009. Um, he defined implant density as the number of anchors, which included hook, wire, and screw per level fused. Um, Clements defined what most surgeons thought to be true uh, at the time in his 2009 paper, which was that greater implant density provided greater correction of the coronal curve. However, it's important to note that in this study, um, that the implants were not exclusively screws. And so when you eliminated the hooks and the wires, uh, what you saw was that um, the, the relationship between the number of screws and the correction um, uh, was not linear and there, it was not associated with increased coronal correction. And so this suggested that more screws did not improve your correction. Clements was also one of the first authors to show that it, as implant density increased, the thoracic kyphosis decreased. In the same year, Lee published a randomized control trial of continuous versus intervally placed screws and showed no difference in coronal correction. Um, and then despite some early reports showing the correlation between implant density and coronal curve correction, there's a mounting body of evidence to show that low density constructs provide similar radiographic outcomes compared to high implant density constructs. So this 2017 meta-analysis from JNS Pediatrics had 827 AIS patients. Um, the range of reported implant densities was 1.04 to 2.0, and the range and the coronal correction was from 64% to 70% correction. So a 100% difference in the screw density only yielded a 6% difference in the coronal cob correction. So many of you will be familiar with the MIMO study group and uh, their large retrospective study from 2014 showed better coronal plane correction with high implant density constructs, but the difference in correction was only four to 5% and the authors questioned whether this was really clinically significant. And then multiple recent studies have showed that lower implant density constructs with predominant implant placement on the concave side of the curve um, have also showed similar corrections to high implant density. And maybe more important than the main coronal cob correction, Yang et al. showed that correction of the uninstrumented spine was not lost when low implant density constructs were compared to high implant density constructs. So now looking at the sagittal plane, Earlier reports by those uh, by, by Quan and Clements showed that the correlation between uh, a loss of thoracic kyphosis, coronal correction, and increased implant density 
Um, however, this idea has been challenged by a lot of authors. And uh, because the anterior column is relatively elongated compared to the posterior column in AIS, increased derotation uh, with pedicle screws can create a loss of kyphosis due to the inherent nature of the deformity. However, there's evidence that the disc contributes four more times to the anterior lengthening, leaving plenty of room uh, for the restoration of thoracic kyphosis. And the HARM study group showed that the correction um, of the sagittal plane was very dependent on the surgeon. Uh, but other variables such as rod size and material and correction maneuvers certainly play a role. And implant density doesn't seem to be uh, as important in the sagittal plane. For the axial plane, it does seem like higher screw density is better. In a randomized clinical study, Godfrey et al. showed no difference in coronal and sagittal correction of linky 1A and 1B curves when comparing high and low density constructs, but better correction of the clinical rib hump with high density, suggesting better rotational correction with the high implant density. And then in 2016, a retrospective review uh, comparing continuous pedicle screw constructs to interval place screws, uh, Katensi et al. were able to show significantly more axial plane correction with continuous pedicle screw constructs by an objective radiographic measurement. All right, so if you decide that you're not going to instrument every level, then the question becomes, where do you put the screws? And this has led to the development of the concept of implant distribution. And so in an effort to identify which levels are most essential to instrument, Nouveau et al. created a nomenclature categorizing the instrumented spine into five functional regions. So there's the, the proximal end, which is defined as the UIV and the level below that. Um, the, the distal end is the LIV plus the level cephalid to that. And then you have the apical region, which is um, either the, the vertebral body or the disc and the two adjacent vertebral bodies. And then everything else um, is considered the uh, upper and lower periapical regions, regardless of uh, their length or number of uh, vertebral segments. Um, in their retrospective review of 279 patients with linky one uh, curve patterns, they found that concave implant density and specifically apical screw density on the concave side was correlated with curve correction in the coronal plane. And additionally, they found the lowest fill rate in the convex periapical regions of the construct. So this would suggest that if lower implant density constructs were going to be used, then maintaining high screw density in the apical con concavity would facilitate successful curve correction, and fewer screws could be used in the periapical regions and on the convexity. Um, admittedly, this is a, an extraordinarily difficult topic to study. There's many intrinsic and extrinsic factors, and it's impossible to control for all of them. Um, so potentially this topic is uh, better served with a biomechanical analysis. And so here you go. In 2018, um, this study had uh, 10 three-dimensional AIS deformity models of actual cases that are in the S SRS MIMO database. Um, they kept the number of levels fused, the screw type, the rod material, the rod size, and the bone screw interface constant across all their simulations. And then they had a reference screw pattern of uh, two pedicle screws at each level. And then they compared that to six different alternate screw patterns uh, shown here on the screen. And the screw densities for the alternate patterns range from 1.2 to 1.7. And so when they ran their analysis, the coronal and sagittal plane correction produced similar radiographic results across the board within four degrees of one another. Um, when they did apical derotation, they saw that the reference 2.0 implant density performed the best. And while the other constructs with high screw density near the apex performed nearly as well within about one degree. Um, so if you remember earlier when we were discussing the rationalization of um, high implant density, you'll recall that the thought was like the more screws you used, the, the less stress each screw would see. But in this biomechanical model, that just didn't seem to be true. And what they ended up seeing was that there was over constraint of the screw and the screws were actually starting to impart um, forces on one another that were counterproductive to the deformity correction. Um, so for the bone screw interface stress, the reference pattern, uh, the 2.0 implant density had the, the, the worst score and the lowest implant density uh, performed the best. So which construct performs the best in the biomechanical model? Um, so if you take the, the aggregate of all the performance measures, it seems that these three models perform the best. Um, but as you can see from the bottom there, those numbers, they have kind of uh, vastly different uh, implant densities and, and significantly different cost efficiencies. 
Um, more recent biomechanical work done by Klen et al. showed that screw design, so for example, like a uniaxial screw over a multiaxial screw, is more important than implant density for deformity correction. And when they decreased the implant density by 30%, there was no difference in correction. However, contrary to the previously discussed biomechanical study, they were, they were able to show that the, um, as the number of screws in the construct decreased, the individual load experienced by each screw increased. Um, so thus far, I, I hope it's possible um, to, uh, uh, or it seems possible that you can uh, achieve radiographic equivalent results with less screws. But the more important question is, can we produce a similar clinical outcome? And this 2018 study looking at 328 patients from the um, a Swedish spine registry uh, who underwent posterior spinal fusion were divided into three categories based on their implant density. So they had low, medium, and high. And when compared with the high density, the, both the low and the medium density implant constructs were shown to have equivalent SRS22, VAS, and EQ5D3L scores at one and three years. Uh, in 2017, Lou et al. published a meta-analysis of 12 studies compiling 900 AIS patients, um, and they um, compared low density and high density pedicle screw constructs. In all of these studies, there was no major difference um, between the constructs. The study supported the use of lower density uh, constructs in AIS surgery because of reduced operative times, reduced blood loss, uh, reduced hospital costs, and maintaining equivalent radiographic and quality of life outcomes. Um, in 2019, uh, this group from Cincinnati Children's Hospital compared 61 consecutive patients with linky one curves, so from 50 to 80 degrees. Um, the patients were divided into two groups. They had a high density group that they termed traditional multi-level pedicle screw strategy, and then a low density group that they termed periapical dropout screw strategy, which was similar to the one shown in the biomechanical study. Um, and so at one, a minimum one year follow-up, the SRS 30 scores were equivalent and the radiographic outcomes were better in the periapical dropout group in the coronal and axial plane using the Cobb angle and the rib index method for their comparison. And then the authors of the study concluded that in the era of healthcare rationalization, the periapical dropout screw strategy is a very cost-effective technique for achieving excellent results. And I'll just make one commentary about this paper. Um, there's two surgeons involved doing these cases, and one surgeon performed all of the high-density uh, constructs, and another surgeon performed all the periapical dropout constructs. So there's likely a performance bias in their results. Um, so this talk would not be complete if I failed to mention that there are some legitimate concerns with low implant density constructs. And many people worry about durability, pseudoarthrosis, and hardware failure. And this paper was published in 2022, and it was the first to show that lower pedicle screw density may be associated with screw plow, um, subsequently resulting in revision surgery. And so when you're making decisions about screw strategy, you want to employ, uh, the, making decisions about the screw strategy that you want to employ, it's important to consider the curve magnitude, the curve stiffness, and the age of the patient as a surrogate for the bone density. All right, um, so in conclusion, the cost of scoliosis surgery has increased dramatically over the past two decades, mostly because, because of implant costs. Certain low implant density constructs have been proven to be radiographically and clinically equivalent to high implant density constructs. And then locally high implant density at the apex of the deformity is important um, when deploying a low density screw strategy. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll admit that I, I certainly trained at a place where we were kind of a, a high density group. But you know, as my um, you know practice, which is still pretty junior, has has kind of evolved, um, I've, I've thought about some of these things, and um, you know, kind of like what we we talked about in in uh, or at least what I mentioned in my talk is I try to you know concentrate the density in the um, apex of the curve on the um, um, in the concave side, and obviously that's. You know, sometimes easier said than done, right? Especially like if it's a lumbar curve, um, you know, those pedicles can be pretty small and you want to have good, you know, pedicle screws. So um, I try to get four solid anchors at the top, four solid anchors at the bottom, and then concentrate some density in the middle. And then I, I do leave out, um, you know, kind of those periapical regions. And, um, you know, I, 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 in my own practice, I haven't seen a, a degradation in the, you know, correction that I get with that. 
Uh, hi. Um, just a quick question. Um, in one of the studies it's, uh, you pointed to, it said that almost all screws receive equal stress. But what's the idea behind concentrating the screws on, on the concavity versus the convexity? Is it compression forces versus distraction? Is there more force in that region of the spine? Um, so you're asking about what's the point of concentrating the screws in the concave side of the curve? Yeah. I, I think just for me, so for my... Um, the, the technique that I use, you know, I, I, I hyper um, kyphos the rod on the concave side. So really having like solid purchase there. I think, you know, a couple years ago, Dr. Skaggs came and he was kind of given the clinical example. You know, if you put one pedicle screw in a cadaver and then you try to yank it out, you can probably pull it out, but put four screws in, connect it with the rod and then try to pull it out. Like, it, you know, you need a lot more force. So just with the technique that I use, I need a lot of force, you know, at that at apex to pull it up. Yeah, I feel like an old codger here because the when when I train, you know, we used CD was the deal, and we used to use hook patterns, and we had tons of different hook, hook patterns. We didn't put a hook at every single level. We would use intermediate hooks, pedicle, you know, apical hooks, and stuff like that in thoracic spine, and then. Uh, after a while, we did hybrid constructs where we based it off of pedicle screw construct at the base. And it seemed like it gave pretty decent correction. Certainly, the, the goal at that time had always been to arrest the progression of the curve and get whatever uh, appropriate cosmesis is possible to balance the shoulders and uh, to decrease the rib hump, which we did uh, thoracoplasties for. So now we're doing three-dimensional correction where by, by rotating the spine with multiple uh, const multiple um, anchors, you could then decrease the rib hump by uh, changing the change the rotation, and that seemed a little bit better. But uh, is it absolutely necessary? Are we are we actually doing too much? We're, we're, because it seemed like what was done before was just enough. Is just enough all right, or is it so much more that we get from being that little bit better. Yeah, I, <clears throat> that's a good point. I, and one of the papers that I didn't talk about, um, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the authors, but you know, they kind of question like, with all this evolving technology, are we actually proving, improving the patient outcome scores? Um, and, and I think there, there was some other literature that, that said yes, you know, we've got some um, subcategories in the SRS uh, questionnaire where you know they seem like they've improved over time, but I think yeah, that's maybe the point. A little bit of my talk is like maybe we can do a little bit less, you know, than or use a little bit less. So I think that's a great question. Whether we're doing, you know, years ago we were doing enough, and we strive to do more and more and more, and are we doing too much, and does it clinically matter? I think you really have to look into sort of self-image numbers too, because. Um, depending on what area of the world or country you actually practice in, the expectation is completely different. You know, I have uh, my practice is in Miami, and um, I mean, the first thing they say when you walk out, you know, they assume that the patient's okay, and they said, "Is the rib hump gone? Does she still have the hump on her back? You know, uh, or what do her shoulders look like?" <laughs> so uh, that may not be the question in different parts of the country, but um, if you look at regional self-image scores, I think you could get a little bit more into that. Now, clinically, are they doing much better in, you know, the place where you don't have a rim hump versus the places where you still have a residual hump? Probably not, right? Uh, but, you know, people's appetite for imperfection <laughs> is different in different parts of the world. So that's another thing to consider. Thank you.